Yeah. Well, I've read a few Dawkins books. Oh, <laughs> I think they're quite good. The only does is like lash out at people who say he's wrong. Yeah, he is quite vitriolic and cantankerous, I guess. He has a... Gene, gene, <sighs> gene. It's all about the genes. Like, obviously it's not. Well... The selfish gene. What a load of old sh**. How can a gene be selfish? <laughs> it doesn't have a self. Coincidentally, uh, Professor Richard Dawkins will be on the podcast next week. <laughs> so we did the walk. The walk? The walk. 26.5 miles across the Isle of Wight. How mm-hmm. did you enjoy it, Adam? Well, I enjoyed it so much, I'm still wearing my medal. Can you hear that? <laughs> Are you really? It well, I am. I don't know whether you could hear it or not now, but I was jangling it in front of the microphone in hope. Oh, we heard the jangling. Don't worry. Got that it. was Yeah, it was good. I, I left my medal at home on the Isle of Wight. I, oh. felt, I felt that that was a more appropriate place for it. There's going to be so many of those medals like on the Isle of Wight, though. Yeah, that is true. Best to spread them out. There's, the, there's a market for them in London. When people see me with my little Isle of Wight shaped medallion walking down the street, what must they think? Like... That's a guy who's got some serious achievements. You don't wear it around the street, do you? No comment. (laughs) Well, I really struggled. I know that you didn't. You did a really sterling job. But I've actually still got a bit of a twinge in my left hip from Mm. the walk. This is two weeks later and my left big toenail has gone completely black. I think it's going to fall so off. so disgusting. Why did you have to tell... I hope you're going to cut that out of the podcast. No, I think I'm going to keep that in. It is gross, yeah. But it's something you've got to be aware of if you're going to be doing a long walk. Well, I had no injuries. Uh, toenails are fine. Mm. Like, everything's fine. It took us, what, 12 hours? I can't believe it took us 12 hours. Like, the further time <laughs> has gone on since, the... the more shocked I am that it took us 12 hours. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't understand how people finished before us. No, because I didn't think we were that slow. No. So for for the listeners, we were incredibly slow. We nearly missed the last bus back. And in fact, when we passed the uh, finish line, they were like packing up, weren't they? The DJ had gone home. I was lucky to get a medal. (laughs) So um, what I think happened is because there was quite a large group of us, I think there were about eight of us, some people lag behind over time. Mm. And, and that changes as well, who was lagging behind. Sometimes it, <laughs> it, it wasn't was me. It was never you. That's right. But at the beginning, it was Bella. Towards the end, it was me. Um, my brother was also struggling uh, with my with my mum. And so, like, I think what happens is when you get to a checkpoint, we all sat down and waited to for the group to get back together again. And then you get spread out again. And then... Yeah, because then the slow people want to sit down. And you're like, exactly. if you wanted to sit down, you should have been with the first people who arrived. But obviously I didn't say this. <laughs> But anyway, so the originally the plan was, of course, to record a podcast on the walk. But actually, in the build up to the walk, logistically, I kind of worked out that that's going to be that was going to be really tough. So instead, we decided to record a video, um, which will appear on our YouTube channel shortly. Please do follow us. I will put a link to the channel in the show notes. I'm currently in the process of editing that video. It's taken me a little little while as I've had a MacBook disaster this week. Mm. But um, it will be it will be going up within the next couple of weeks. What have you been up to? I joined a softball team. What is softball? I still don't know that. I know I know <laughs> that I told you this when we were on the Isle of Wight. It's a bit like rounders. Yeah. And baseball. We- with a mitt, you use a mitt, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You use you use a glove and uh, a bat, and there's four bases. I guess there's mm-hmm. three bases and one home, and then you know you hit the ball and run around. It's easy to pick up. Mm, okay. Yes, and I'm in a tournament uh, next weekend, so we'll see how that goes. Do you have positions in softball, or is it like cricket? Everybody does a little bit of everything. Well, I think for our novice team, everyone's going to be doing a bit of everything, but. There's like infield and outfield positions. Mm. So obviously I'll be in the outfield chilling out. Okay. So you're not a, a champion batter or bowler. I can hit the ball sometimes. Okay. Well, it sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's do Dinosaur of the Month. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. We've been doing Dinosaur of the Month for quite a few episodes now. I'm not sure on the exact count, but quite a few. I'm sure you would agree. Yeah. And traditionally, it's always about a new species that's been discovered that month or recently. Well, I which think is... they, they are the rules of Dinosaur of the Month, aren't they? Exactly. Because to... I claimed that you didn't have enough. Exactly. My point was that the field of paleontology is undergoing this golden age with uh, it was something like 50 dinosaur species a year being discovered. But considering we've been doing it for quite some time now, do you, would you agree that we've entered this golden age? I just thought it would be good to revisit. I'm, well, I'm not going to agree if, if you're going to say, well, we won't do the, the rules from before. Now I'll, I'll just pick an old dinosaur. <laughs> that is what I want to do. dinosaur of the month. <laughs> that is what I want to do. I don't think well, T-Rex... here he goes. <laughs> the, the thing is, I spend a lot of time researching dinosaur news now. And there's so much stuff out there that I think is really cool about existing species. But I always feel like it's a shame that I can't talk about it. You're right. I understand. Like, you're looking at a new species. What do they really know about it? Like, exactly. how big the bone they found was, which isn't a very compelling story for the podcast. So go on, I'll allow it. Thank you very much. So that's good. So I've got your permission now to yep. allow this segment to evolve. This time? Okay, just this time. <laughs> I still want regular updates about new dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay. All right. Well, okay. This month then, I've got something different for you. And this was a piece of news brought to my attention by one of our New Zealand listeners, actually, oh. who hosts their own podcast, History of Aotearoa. I don't know how you pronounce it. I hope I've not ruined that. But uh, it's the original Maori name for New Zealand which translates to land of the long white cloud. Oh. Yeah, which is nice. But mm. hereafter, I will be referring to it as New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll include a link to that podcast in the show notes, actually. So perhaps quite understandably, this dinosaur news relates to a discovery in New Zealand. And can you think of any dinosaurs from this part of the world, Adam? Oh, I could name some birds, but I guess that's not what you're after. Actually, that is exactly what I'm after. Well, here we go then. The mower. <laughs> the mower is the one. That's well, right. That's the only one I could have named, so thank <laughs> God. Maybe Kittywake, is that from New Zealand? Uh, yeah, is that the little parrot thing? Mm -hmm. The kiwi is another bird. Yeah. Um, the kakapo is the mm. parrot, I think. Well, anyway, um, so the mower, which we've talked about before, um, is an enormous extinct flightless bird, which, as we all know, are dinosaurs, not just the flightless ones, but all of them, all, all birds. Uh, so the largest mower species would have reached 12 feet in height. What's that in metres, like four metres? Something, it's like a double-decker bus, isn't it? Wow, is that really? No, that, I don't know, no. 12 feet. Yeah. 12, four metres, I think. There's three feet in a metre, isn't there? Um, but in comparison, the largest extant bird species, what's that? The ostrich nice uh that can reach nine feet so this had a good few feet on the ostrich god but nine feet is huge as well like i feel like i've seen ostriches and they weren't nine feet well this is the absolute tallest males okay they're scary old birds it's all neck mm, oh yeah that's true they are all neck how how tall are you are you six foot i'm five foot eight and a half okay wow so uh, this mower species then, the average at 12 feet would have been, you know, more than twice your height. That's, yeah. I, I think that's crazy. <laughs> anyway, the mower, which had its genome reconstructed last year, and we talked about that in one of our first episodes, uh, the mower went extinct sometime in the 14th to 15th centuries, which has been attributed to, guess... Well, it sounds pretty suspicious. If, if things have gone extinct in the human lifetime, then it's probably us, isn't it? Yeah, the mower was hunted to extinction. And as you can imagine, considering it went extinct quite recently, we've found quite a few bones and eggshell fragments enabling us to reconstruct the skeleton and get a pretty good idea of, of what this bird looked like. Mm. Well, um, I imagine so they're quite hard to lose. What do you mean? Because they're so big? Yeah, 12-foot bird. 
Yeah. Scout like yeah. That. Oh my word! Like the leg bones are enormous. Let me show you a picture of a reconstructed skeleton. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a pretty meaty. Well, it's not even a thigh, is it? It's just the bone. So it's a, it's enormous bone, and then also some paleo art as well for good measure. Just yeah. to give you a good idea. I, I guess it it looks like what you'd expect it to look like. Just a fluffy, big bird. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. That's that's what the mower looks like. All links in the show notes, of course. Um, now, the news this month is, and this is why I wanted to, you know, change the rules a little bit, because I, I, I really like this, and I think you will do too. Uh, a tractor driver in New Zealand made an incredible discovery while he was just walking along a river on the South Island, and he spotted seven mower tracks measuring around 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres, embedded in the rock uh, in the riverbed of a swimming hole. Mm. And I know you like a good preserved footprint. I do, yes. So let me show you these. There's a short video on the Otago Museum Twitter page. And they are amazing, these footprints. Okay, yeah, no, they are amazing. The first one was a bit rubbish. And I was worried I was going to have to slag them off. But no, the, the rest of them are pretty good. <laughs> they are, aren't they? 30 like, centimetres really... by 30 centimetres. Yes. Each, yeah, so f- each print. A foot by a foot, yeah. Wow. It's a big, pretty big foot. It's the same size as our foot. My foot is not 30 centimetres. <laughs> well, not, okay. But not <laughs> it's not Maybe... like in a square, basically. No, you're right, yeah. I haven't got my toes stretched out to a span of 30 centimetres. That's disgusting. <laughs> Yeah, so um, obviously the moa went extinct, as I said, uh, about 500 years ago. But these tracks are actually at least 1 million years old Mm. and could be as old as 11 million. That's what analysis of the rock is saying so far. I'm sure we'll get like a closer estimate with further analysis, but um, 1 million is the absolute earliest that they were made. And the way that the tracks are laid out suggests that the mower was walking slowly through muddy sediment before turning slightly to the right. Mm. And once again, I'm just blown away by this preservation of what is seemingly such an innocuous moment. I love that we can actually see the million-year-old behaviour of an animal that belongs to an extinct order. And we can, like see what what direction it was going in and everything. It's incredible, isn't it? I don't... Well, yeah, I guess so. You're you're not fussed about that. I just find it crazy that uh, at least a million years ago, a mower walked along some muddy sediment and we can still see that it did that today. Yeah. And it's also these things have been hidden. They've only just recently been unearthed by, I think, a flooding event, they, they think it is. I, I just, I love stuff like that. Yeah. Now, it does make you wonder what your legacy will be, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, what have I done? Have I left any marks on this world that will still be here 1 million to 11 million years in the future? I highly suspect not. You might have done. Maybe. But for all the mowers that were walking around New Zealand, how many of them actually left marks? One in a hundred thousand? One in a million? Well, I guess we'll. it's hard to say because, as you say, these footprints have only just been uncovered because of flooding, right? Mm-hmm. That, I mean, maybe we're going to get a whole wealth of mower memories. Yeah, that would be good. Mm. That would be really good. So, anyway, that's Dinosaur of the Month. It's a bird, it's a mower, and next week we'll go back to a new species. This week in my PhD, I moved on to collecting data about a new group of insects. Uh, the true bugs. Okay. What's an example of a true bug? Okay, so so what separates these characteristically from the rest of the insects is their mouth parts. They have what's called a stylet, which is a bit like a stiff straw, which most mm. of them use to poke into a plant and then suck sap out. Usually, usually. Okay. But I understand that, like, the term bug is applied colloquially to most insects, right? Mm-hmm. So I thought before we start the news story, it might be good for us to play a little game to uh, let people know what, what are bugs and what aren't, which I call true bug or false bug. I love that. Okay, great. Yeah, it's it's easier than the last game we played because I know you struggled. What game did we play last? 
the the biggest human killer. Oh god, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, go on then. Yep. Okay, so I've got a list. Number one, ladybugs. True bug or false bug? No. That's a false bug, it's a beetle. Yeah, that's correct. I I did an easy one to start on. The bug part, as far as I can tell, is an American corruption. Okay. We call them ladybirds in the UK. The lady bit is from the Virgin Mary, obviously. Oh. Yeah, because... So our most common ladybird, the seven spot. Like seven is apparently a big religious number. The seven sorrows of the Virgin Mary. Seven deadly sins. Yeah, and she used to wear a red cape, Mary. Oh, okay. Before, before they changed all that. So that's why they called it a ladybird. It's called a Mary beetle in Germany for the what's, same reason. Okay, a Mary beetle. And what's the bird part of that? Do you know? Well, it flies. It's like Our Lady's bird. Ah, uh, okay. Right. Um, so, yeah, when it, obviously when we took the name to America, they were like, oh, it's not a bird, it's a bog. And we we're mm. like, it's a metaphor, mate, but okay. Not a lady either, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay. Uh, number two, frog hoppers. Frog hopper? Hmm. I don't really know what a frog hopper is, I don't think. So, you might have heard them called spittle bugs. Spittle bugs. Spittle bugs. They're the nymphs, really, but... Hmm. Can I have a look? Let me... Yeah, feel free. Frog hopper. The actual name does ring a bell, and I'm sure when I look at a picture... Oh, I do know these. Yes. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say that this is a true bug. Yeah, that's correct. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so you, people might... Well, I mean, you can have a Google of them, but people might know these insects because the nymphs produce what we call cuckoo spit. Ah, that, is that where they come from? Okay. Yeah. Cuckoo sp- yeah. Cuckoo spit. It's like a sort of frothy... Well, like liquid that you find on plants yeah. in the summer, right? There was actually a thing in the news this week about um, asking people to report sightings of cuckoo spit. I don't know what people call it everywhere, if that's like the right name for it. Well, I always call it cuckoo spit. That's how yeah. I know it, yeah. Okay, number three, green fly. So green fly are like the bugs that ladybirds eat, yeah? Yeah. And you get them on, on your roses, is yeah. that right? And the, yeah, you want like ladybirds to eat them off because they're a pest. Um, I think green fly is probably a type of fly, so I'm going to say not a true bug, false bug. Ooh, unfortunately, it is a true bug. You <sighs> might have, yeah, a green fly, you might have heard the name aphid. Uh, are they the same thing? Yeah, so, well, there are lots of different aphids. Obviously, there are black ones that people call black fly, but like the, the ones that I see out and about are green, and I call them green fly. Okay. And uh, but yeah, I- it's an aphid. It is a bug. Um, and as you say, yeah, it uses its stylet and pokes into your rose bushes and sucks all the sap out. Mm. And ants, um, like, cultivate them, don't they? Or yeah, look after them? Yeah, some milk them. Yeah. Make, make secretions, yeah. Mm, okay. Okay, we've got two more. Rain bugs. Hmm, let me Google a rain bug. Oh, are these the tiny little red ones? Yeah. That, yeah, you'll often get them crawling on rocks and things. Yeah. Um, and and if you squish one, not that I advocate going around squishing I them. I have but done you, it though, yeah, on like a plastic garden chair. Yeah, you'll end up with a little red splodge. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm going to say that that... Uh, I'm going to go, yeah, true bug. Oh, it's not a bug. Oh. It's not even an insect. What? What is that, it? That is, in fact, a mite. Oh. So mites are arachnids, more closely related to spiders and scorpions. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, so that was that was a, a, a trick one, really. So they're, they're really large, aren't they, um, for mites? Because mites are usually microscopic, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, they're not, they're not large, but like, yeah, for a mite, mm. I'll give you that. Okay. Um, last one then, bed bugs. Bed bugs. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I've ever seen a bed bug in the flesh. I don't even mm. know if I know what they look like, really. But Well, this whole story is going to be about them, so. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah. Um, so coming from a fairly ignorant standpoint, I'm just going to say that I think they're a type of louse. And so I'm going to say no, not a bug. They are, in fact, a bug. 
Oh, I did, I did terribly then. Well, we started off so well, and then the last three were just just trickier <laughs> ones. So, unlike most um, bugs, bed bugs don't use their stylet to pierce and suck up sweet, sweet sap. Uh, as I'm sure, well, you haven't had them, but I'm sure anybody mm. who has, they, they use their stylet to suck up your blood. Okay. Oh, so, so they're actual blood suckers. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. So instead of, uh. you know, just like the aphids going in, sticking its stylet into the plant and sucking out the sap, it's just doing it to you. It does the same, okay. Yeah, so they are in fact obligate hematophages. So that means they have to eat blood. Like, insects have an exoskeleton, right? Mm-hmm. And the way that they grow is by getting a little bit bigger and then shedding their outside once they've outgrown it, molting, yeah? Every time a baby bed bug needs to, uh, to molt to get to adult size, it needs to do it about five times. And every time that it molts, it needs to have a meal first. And then every time that uh, it wants to make some eggs, it has to have a meal first. So this is, requires a lot of blood, really. Wow. I mean, they're only small, so it, it's not going to, yeah. Do they only feed on human blood? Are they specialised for that? We'll come on to that a little bit. Okay. Um, a little bit further on. I was going to ask you if you've ever had bed bugs, but I guess not, seeing as you've never seen them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've already answered that. I don't think so. Yeah. Have you? Have you had bed bugs? No, I haven't. Like... From my reading about them, it seems they went into a big decline in the, uh, like, onwards from the 1950s because of insecticide use. Mm. But, like, e- even then, like, my mum, every night when she was putting us in bed, would say, sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. If they do, use dynamite. Well, she never said that, but... <laughs> no, that's what I used to say back to my mum. Saw it on a film once. But, yeah. Um... So there was still always something I was aware of even though I've never felt particularly threatened by them. Yeah, culturally, they are certainly a a thing that you're aware of, kind of like cockroaches, yeah. where like I'm totally aware of cockroaches in the kitchen, but I don't think I've ever seen a cockroach in the UK, ever. Mm. I understand they're like a, a thing in motels in America. Yeah. <laughs> uh, same as bedbugs, I guess. But yeah. yeah, so I don't know whether it's more of an Americanism thing or I assumed perhaps bed bugs were more of an American thing. Well, no, Aristophanes, the uh, great Greek playwright mentioned in, in one of his plays. Oh, OK. I was going to take down the thing, but I think he called them bum bandits. So I thought, oh, wow, won't be won't be using that term. <laughs> um, so some people can have rather severe reactions to bad bed bugs, but. On the whole, they mainly just cause discomfort rather than posing any serious threat. Mm -hmm. So they don't pass on diseases or anything like that, as far as I'm aware. Okay. But people still find them, you know, repulsive, disgusting. And I can kind of understand it. Like, if you pull up your fitted sheet and there's loads of insect shit, it's not very nice to then lie down on your mattress, is it? No, it's not. And also, just generally getting bitten is not nice. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how what a bed bug bite is like compared to a mosquito bite. But, you know, nobody likes getting bitten by mosquitoes or gnats or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's itchy to keep you awake at night. Definitely. Yeah, like, of course, they're, they're a pest, they're a nuisance. Yeah. So, yeah. The other big interesting thing about bed bug biology, uh, simicids is their um, scientific name. Okay. They practice traumatic insemination. You aware of this? Traumatic insemination? Yeah. No, I don't know. That it's, it doesn't sound very nice. Well, I mean, it's, I, they cope with it. So the female has a reproductive tract that she uses to lay the eggs out of, but the males aren't interested in it. So every time an adult female has a meal, has some blood, the males will go up to her and pierce straight through the female's abdomen and stick the sperm in there. Oh, my goodness. But, I mean, she'll live. Like the, She's got a specialised organs like inside her abdomen that will... Uh, make the sperm migrate towards the reproductive system. Um, yeah, she she copes. She usually gets five traumatic inseminations per feeding. So, oh, God. <laughs> it is a bit weird. But a new paper came out last week in Current Biology, which is bringing up some questions about how bed bugs got into our beds. So there are two species that are mainly associated with humans. The common bed bug. Oh, God. <laughs> You know it's going to be a good one when no, it's it not, is. No, it's not even that bad. Simex lectularis. Okay. The common bed bug, Simex lectularis, and the <laughs> tropical bed bug, Simex hemipterus. Okay. 
And a popular idea in the past was that these different species diverged along with the ancient human lineage. As the human lineage split off into, say, sapiens and erectus, like we both kept different parasites or something like that. But the vast majority of bed bugs instead feed on bats or birds. Even the ones that, like us, are most commonly found on bats. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but just like we get bed bugs, they don't live on the hosts like um, nits or crabs would. They just live near the host, where the host lives. Mm-hmm. So bats have roosts or birds will have nests and we have beds. Yeah, okay. This is quite an unusual strategy for like a niche. It is. I guess it's comparable though to, a, like I, I said earlier on with lice, you get lice in your clothes, don't you? Yeah, but they don't they don't want to be there. They want to be on you, don't they? Yeah, maybe you're right actually. Whereas the bed bugs, they re- they d- don't want to be like clinging onto you, ca- being carried around during the day. Like they're very skittish, like that's the reason they come for you at night when you're asleep. Mm. If if you're awake, then they're all just going to run off to the crack of the mattress. Wow, yeah, they're cowardly. Cowardly. Well, let's see. Let's see the story of their evolution first. Okay, okay, yeah, please. Um, so people thought that bats were the original hosts of bed bugs, and this is what one of the findings in the new paper also suggests. But importantly, the age of the bed bug family is now placed 115 million years old. So to put this in some context, this is 20 to 50 million years before bats came on the scene. So unless something's gone very wrong on the bat side, it appears like they weren't the original hosts, right? Yeah. Okay. So what about birds? They also appear to be a later addition to the menu than bats. Mm. Uh, There are three main groups of bed bugs that feed on birds. One of them feeds mainly on solitary nesting birds, and the other two uh, use colony nesting birds, which is kind of similar to a bat colony, right? Uh, uh, Like bat roosting, colony nesting, Mm -hmm. you know, bats in a cave, birds on cliffs, whatever. You can Mm -hmm. see how it might have been an easy transfer from bats to birds and also in terms of like the colony roosting like one bat or bird isn't going to be that good at maintaining a thriving population of bed bugs is it but Mm -hmm. if they're all living together that's a lot of blood in total so as for this idea that our human pest bugs evolved uh, along with humans that's also out of the window because they diverged 47 million years ago uh, which is a long time before apes existed let alone ours but it's kind of easy to see why they chose us, though. Like, this is conjecture, but this is, this is how I've put the story together in my head, right? Okay. Homo sapiens, we used to, oh, we used to love a cave, didn't we? <laughs> I, I guess so. I suspect so, yeah. I, mean, has... I, I think there's probably good evidence that we like a cave. You know, all the paintings, the but scorch <laughs> marks and stuff. We were kicking around in caves. We were... But then I do think there's a lot of bias. I think people assume that we were living in caves big time. Because, because caves preserve better. Because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> then, then all the tree carvings we did and all the living under the stars and in mm. forests. Yeah, but yeah, like clearly... Oh, we were in caves. That, yeah, yeah. You know, that much is undeniable. Some of us were in caves. Yeah. At some point. So I can kind of imagine it like humans go into a cave, have a bit of a cave party, light a fire, you know, grunting, whatever they were doing, talking maybe, mm-hmm. disturbing the bats who might abandon the roost. And then what about the poor bed bugs? Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, so the, the bats are disturbed. They flee the cave to settle somewhere else. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, the bed bugs are left over. You can imagine them. Okay, what else is in this cave? Oh, some nice big fleshy sacks of blood mm. let's have them mm. yeah I, d- I don't think it's hardly a surprise that they switched to us given that i think that makes total sense all right i, I agree with you mm. uh, but then i wonder whether i guess it's almost impossible to know this but whether humans used to sleep on some sort of like substrate that would make it easier for the bed bugs you know we can't just lay down on the rocky floor i wonder if we <laughs> made like a little nest like gorillas do, out of leaves and stuff, because that would make it even easier. Yeah, that does seem kind of likely that it would would be some sort of vegetation rather than... I don't know, so many things seem happy lying on the floor, though, don't they? Yeah, but God, not me. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Even just human lying on floor, 
the the reason bed bugs like a mattress is because there's plenty of like crevices where they can hide, which I assume is also true of most cave floors. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. But the invention of the mattress was like the bed bugs must have not known what's hit them. They're like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. This is fantastic. It's like a hotel, isn't it, for bed bugs? In fact, their their entire existence, or their their actual like the name of their like order or whatever they are, was literally Family. assigned <laughs> the name bed bugs based on the fact that they love mattresses so much. Yeah, bat bugs would be a more accurate name, really. Yeah, or roost bugs, or roost bugs. That's cool. Nest, even nest bugs, I think you could do because like. In terms mm. of what is actually a bug living there. Mm. So there were multiple different bed bug lineages before the bats came along. And they all must have been feeding on something, right? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, they never get to the bottom of this in the paper. But I don't know, you're, you're the, uh, you, you love the dinosaurs, don't you? What was kicking <laughs> around 100 million years ago? Dinosaurs? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's immediately what I thought. I didn't want to ruin it because I thought that that might be where you were going. But mm. yeah, when you said doesn't look like it was bats, well, it can't have been bats because it predates bats. Uh, it can't have been birds or it doesn't look like it was birds. It's clearly, you know, what is a parasite most likely to feed on in the age of reptiles? Probably those massive, tasty dinosaurs. Yeah, so I think by looking at... The qualities that uh, we, or I guess more than us, like our beds have. I don't know whether we know enough about the dinosaur fauna of caves to have a guess of what it could be. But as you say, I guess they would be best preserved in the caves. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming they, they would have lived in caves. A cave is just a good shelter, isn't it, for any any creature. That's why bears sleep in them. That's why... Well, bats sleep in them. Certainly it's like a place to go and reproduce or something. A cave, it, you know, seems a little bit safer. Mm. Yeah, definitely. We've got a lot of time to play with, don't we? <clears throat> Let's say, all right, I, I'm going into conjecture mode now. Let's say these, these bed bugs originated in just the nests of dinosaurs out in the open or in trees. Yeah. You know, it, you could see how they would gradually over time move into caves once the birds started to bring them into caves. I mean, swallows are very famous for living in caves, aren't they? And then, of course, yeah. you're switching over to bats and then to, to humans. That's an incredible journey, actually, if it, if it did work like that. But are, Were there group nesting dinosaurs then? I suspect so. Mm. I, I, I can't think of any on the top of my head, but, I mean, there was herding dinosaurs weren't there yeah. and there were dinosaurs that filled almost every ecological niche that uh is filled nowadays so like yeah it absolutely makes sense if there there are group nesting birds now why wouldn't there have been group nesting dinosaurs because they're vicious they're not all vicious though are no. they like birds are dinosaurs we've already been through this yeah, true, true. this episode <laughs> so yeah perhaps they didn't you know a t-rex looks to me like it was probably a solitary Nesta, and maybe the bed bugs never bothered the T Rex, but you know something like a, I don't know, Gallimimus. You know the Gallimimus? No, I'm not familiar with the Gallimimus. Seriously, need to watch Jurassic Park. Oh, I've seen Jurassic Park. No, you haven't. We've okay. done this, haven't we? I've told you to watch it, and you've been like, I've watched Jurassic World. Yeah, that's the one. Watch Jurassic Park. I can't Park. believe we do this every single time, apparently, and I never remember. Yeah, you have to watch Jurassic Park. Then you'll know what a Gallimimus is. I've read the book. Yeah, and I think Gallimimus might be in the book. The film's totally different from the book, though. I mean, not okay. totally different, obviously, but it's watch it. Definitely watch it. Are there it. any bed bugs in it? Not that I know of. Okay. No, not that I can remember. Yeah, I, I don't mind it when a scientific paper gets to the end and it's like, well, we thought we knew the answer before. It, the answer was bats. And now we just have no idea, really. Isn't that nice? Opening to, opening to talk for anyone else, like any of our listeners who think they've got an idea, think they know how to test it, go and find the original host of the bed bog. Recycling is great. But is what we're doing when we put our bins out really recycling? 
Quite often, the complex materials that we recycle end up being downcycled. It gets turned into a lower grade, homogenous version of its former self. In 2002, Michael Braungart and William McDonoghue published a manifesto, hoping to change the way that the manufacturing process works by taking inspiration from nature and its cycles. Cradle to Cradle, Rethinking the Way We Make Things is full of ideas that will make you rethink the modern mantras about harm reduction and efficiency. The message of the book is, we should be trying to make things that are good, not just less bad. If this sounds like your kind of book, then take a look in the show notes or at genericdrift.com where you can purchase the book and help support the podcast. Back to the show. Would you describe yourself as a fussy eater? <laughs> I think others would, but I I don't see how I could be described as a fussy eater, really. Really? No, not really. Like, I don't have harsh requirements, right? No, I think you're probably quite easy to cater for. Yeah. But uh, I think you're still a fussy eater. Well, I don't like vegetables, that's true. Mm hmm. Or fruits. I don't like anything that doesn't taste nice. That's just, that's it. Well, yeah. So, you yeah, look... I guess I am a fussy eater because I think most things don't taste nice. At one point, I thought that water had a disgusting taste. Do you like water now? I don't love it, but I've just, it's, I, I can understand when people say it doesn't taste of anything now. I, I like it now. I, mm. I actually like, you know, enjoy a glass of water although i especially like it with a slice of lemon and uh an ice cube (laughs) okay yeah so i'm a fussy eater yes i would describe you i would certainly describe you as a fussy eater and depending on you know you might describe me as a fussy eater i would also describe myself as a fussy eater when i was younger Mm. not necessarily myself now but when I switched to a vegetarian diet at mm. the age of 15, my mum said it was a nightmare to cook meals for me because I was a vegetarian who didn't like vegetables. Like yeah. you, I, I thought they all tasted disgusting. I thought water tasted disgusting. I liked sugary things and I guess all the meat substitutes, that sort of stuff. Proteiny things. Am I like the natural experiment of what would have happened to you if you didn't grow up? No, I don't think so. Okay. Because I, I kind of feel like a lot of teenagers are like that. They don't like vegetables. It's almost a stereotype, isn't it? Eat your greens. Well, and still, yeah, okay. You're extraordinary in that you've retained that behaviour. Mm. Whereas where I've got older, and I see this with a lot of my other friends as well, I've developed a real taste for vegetables and salads and all sorts of like savoury meals. I still love a bit of sugar, but actually I find myself yearning for fresh greens more and more. Like occasionally I'll just be like, oh God, I, I love just a, a salad. Oh. <laughs> just all that crispy, crunchy I would green. Love a salad. Oh, I am like that. I am like that. And also I find myself like that with savoury foods as well. Um, you know, like a potato, a jacket potato. I'm like, oh yes, please. Uh, and actually just enjoyment of food is something that has rocketed for me yeah i love food. i think that's the thing with me is that i'm not that fussy but like i'm not going to put effort in because it all does the same job really don't it just filling a hole i used to feel like that is just fuel and if i could take a tablet every day that would replace my hunger and provide me with the nutrients i would switch to that yeah but as i've sort of uh, like I'd say probably mid twenties onwards, I've developed like a love for food and like cheeses and and also booze, like wines and beers and stuff. Like oh my god, J- just the, that the taste, the textures, everything. <laughs> I've become a real foodie, <laughs> even though I can't cook. Bella still is the designated cook, if you will. Mm. Well, designated eater. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, I I mentioned that I became a vegetarian when I was a teenager and that was principally for ethical reasons. It was actually at school. We had a group of people come in. They showed me a documentary about intensive farming or not just me, the whole the whole um, school. The whole island. (laughs) No, just my school. Uh, And they showed us a documentary about intensive farming and what the animals go through in those factories. Yeah. And um, I decided that I couldn't support that. And that's a mentality that I maintained for well over 10 years until a couple of years ago, I had a moment where something just clicked. And I realized that the most popular ethical diets, if you will, 
vegetarianism and veganism uh, are based on a bit of a fallacy in that they rely on a clear cultural distinction between animals and plants. And sure, right? Like you can argue this is based in I science. I can argue that there are differences between animals and plants. <laughs> Absolutely, you can. Like animals and plants belong to two different taxonomic kingdoms. Yes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, life doesn't work like that. Yeah. The lines are blurrier in reality. And I think we've talked about it before, but for example, sea sponges, sea cucumbers, corals, they all belong to the animal kingdom. Yeah. But you could probably forgive a layman for assuming that they were a type of plant, for example. I don't know if plant, but certainly not an animal. Not an animal, yeah, perhaps. Not an yeah. an, they, they, it's, they're, they're quite alien, right? I mean, obviously a sponge doesn't look that alien to us, but like if you'd... <laughs> If we had never encountered a sponge, you wouldn't say, oh, that's, that's probably an animal, yeah. But a, a coral for me, I guess, I, I, I think I thought that they were plants before I started actually studying biology because I guess they do the same thing that plants do in seawater. Like they photosynthesize, they provide colour and cover the ground. Do you know what I mean? So I could see why people might assume they were, yeah. But, but, I could see why yeah. people would think seaweed was a plant. Well, it is. Oh, no, it's not. It's an algae, isn't it? Oh, we won't keep that in. Oh, no, I will. I will. Because, again, I think it's good to make mistakes. And, and also, I, I'm proud of myself for recognising my mistakes so quickly there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, yeah, exactly, you see. like. Yeah, no, but that's what I would say. I would, say, I would see seaweed. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, it probably wasn't that long ago that I learned seaweed was an algae. <laughs> well, it was about 30 seconds ago for me. Um, but... Seaweed, I'd say, yeah, but a coral, no. Okay, fine. But for argument's sake, then, like you say, you could forgive somebody for not knowing that that's an animal. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, there are plants like Venus flytraps, pitcher plants, other carnivorous plants, which consume other organisms to extract energy. Yeah. And that's a behaviour that, generally speaking, separates animals from plants, wouldn't you say? Mm, um... Consuming other organisms? Yeah, let's say yes. Okay, the two kingdoms are different, but there's a bit of, you know, mimicry in behaviour, I guess you could say. Mm. And herein lies the problem, right? Clumping all animals together and affording them all the same freedoms, rights and treatments is, <laughs> in, in my opinion, completely absurd. Right. You are implying that a cow has parity with a clam, which is simply insane. It's just not true, is it? Of course, a, a cow and a clam are so different from one another. Mm -hmm. And of course, if, if somebody came up to me, uh, and uh, you know, I, I feel empathy for both of those organisms, but I feel a hell of a lot more for the cow. Yeah. Somebody had a gun and pointed it at the cow or the clam and said, choose one. I'd be like, yeah, blow the mollusk. Like, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> having come to this realisation more than a decade in the making, <laughs> I decided I couldn't make a moral case against eating some animals. Mm -hmm. And specifically, that uh, was bi bivalves to begin with. So I began eating mussels, clams, oysters, all those types of animals. And it was great. I really, I really enjoyed them. Gateway. Uh, yeah, exactly. They were a bit of a gateway because then I decided I would also be okay with eating crustaceans and started eating prawns and had some lobster as well. And it's all delicious stuff. And then finally, and I've arrived at where I am now, which is the conclusion that I'm also okay with eating fish yeah. as long as they're sustainably caught. And I try to apply that logic to everything I eat, animal plants or fungi, like I want to buy sustainable foods. So when people ask me what my dietary preferences are, I usually say that I'm a vegetarian just for simplicity, but <laughs> that isn't what I am. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm something else, um, which doesn't really have a, a name. Now, the reason I bring this up is not to preach my values at you or anything like that. Uh, and I've known you long enough to know that that would be as useful as screaming into the vacuum of space. Honest, no, well, listeners, <laughs> if you could go back in time five years or so and heard me saying the stuff that Harvey's just told you, you would, you would be shocked at Harvey's response. Like, Yeah, I've changed my mind. I've changed my opinion. But I wish somebody had approached me about this. I wish somebody had had a sophisticated conversation about diet because actually that doesn't happen enough. As, as well, it somebody wasn't sophisticated. Who... It was probably me drunkenly 
ranting. But, you know, the content was, I'm sure it must be in there. Now that's all vegetarians and vegans get, though, is a yeah. bunch of jeering and japes and not very well thought out arguments like, um, oh, what if, what if we all stopped eating cows? What would we do with all the cows? Things like that, you know, and, and like, oh, God, but then we'd just be using all that land for soy and it's like, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> we won't go into that. The reason I bring it up is because as somebody who chooses groups of animals to eat, there's mm. another group of animals that many people around the world incorporate into their diet, but I don't. And as far as I'm aware, I don't think you do either. Although it is certainly a group that's close to your heart. And you're going to know what it is, right? Hexapods? Arthropods, specifically in insects. Well, insects are hexapods, but okay. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, All insects right. like so. Well, insects, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to talk about eating bugs. Right. Mm -hmm. But actually, actually not the, not bugs, probably not just bugs, insects, as we've already defined in this, uh, yeah. this episode. Yeah, people eat like black soldier fly larvae. Do they? Yeah. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions then. Have you ever eaten an insect? I have. What insect have you eaten? I've eat, well, not, not alive, but I've mm -hmm. eaten cricket flapjacks, um, yeah. silkworm pupae, maybe something with ants in it. Wow, okay. And of course, famously, I once swallowed a daddy long legs on a field trip, accidentally. <laughs> Which is a crane fly for anybody who, uh, who is interested. Oh my God. Yeah, it was like combination <laughs> inhale, swallow. Oh my word. Okay, but that was involuntary. Yeah, that, I, I wouldn't do that again because people say they're very poisonous. Well... They say they're very they're the most venomous creature on earth, but they yeah. don't have any teeth, don't they? Mm. Which is nonsense. Well. It's just obviously nonsense. <laughs> what would be the point of using energy to generate all that venom if you're never going to be able to use it? It's True. dumb. It would die out in generations. Um anyway, what do you think of eating insects then? Like, you've eaten a few. Um, I thought they were gross, to be honest. Like, I don't want to put people off doing it because I think it's a great idea, but the taste is not for me. It really? Was sort of, um, kind of crustacean-y, I guess. Like, a sort of fishy aftertaste. But mm. Mm, not what I would call nice. But I, I think that there are ways to process them, like, as a source of protein, which are not being fully exploited. People don't want to eat bugs. They'll eat stuff with fl bug flour, won't they? People in the West don't like eating bugs, but they're very popular in other parts of the world. Wow. Very popular. And yeah, you're, you're right, like using them as flour or as an ingredient in something. Mm. Yeah, might be a, a way to go. It's interesting how many insects you've eaten, because I've never eaten a single one. One of the PhD students who works in my lab has an outreach project where it goes around to different festivals and feeds people insects so oh i think they follow us on twitter actually yeah probably yeah i can't remember what the handle's called eat bugs eat bugs yeah okay i should have yeah. probably promoted that a while ago but okay we, we've done it <laughs> well uh link in the show notes obviously um but yeah okay all right interesting i guess you are less fussy than me though with your insecty diet mm-hmm mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyway, well, I, I didn't like them, so it's not like I'm going to be... There's bags of them in the lab, but I, if I was hungry in the afternoon, I wouldn't think oh, I'll just have a couple of silkworm pupae. They're not a nice mm. snack. Mm, okay. Well, the reason I bring this up is because there's some news from this month. In the London-based sushi chain, Avocado, which um, I visit occasionally to get Occasionally sushi, usually soups. Uh, Avocado has introduced crickets to its menu. Right. And they, they've added them to their, is it poke bowls? Poke bowls? Um, which are dishes with poke bowls. rice. No, po poke. I think it's poke bowls. And they're like, it's like a bowl with rice, fresh fish and veg. And now an option is to have that sprinkled with roasted crickets on top. Okay. Yeah. I guess and they're going to be crushed, though, right? They would, no. they would provide some nice texture. I'll give you that. It's because it's full of chitin, aren't they? So they're quite crunchy. Crunchy, yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, so I've, I've sent you a picture okay. of, well, a promo image, I guess, of the crickets, and you can see them. 
they're clearly, I think they might be roasted or something, and they've been marinated in something sprinkled with some sort of, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think they look like crickets, don't they? Which is what still put me off, like... Even when they were in the flapjacks and stuff that I've tried, like you could still occasionally see a bit of leg and you're like, oh, God. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Just like hanging out of the side of the flapjack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. There is something so repulsive, but that is just cultural. I, yeah. I, because we I well, I don't know if you do, but like I said earlier on, I eat prawns and I think prawns are absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. And I'll even eat a prawn... You know, when it's just delivered to you with everything and you have to crack it open and pull the legs off and everything, you know? Yeah. Like, I, w I will do that and I will do that and think it's delicious. And and lobster is the same. I don't know whether it's because these crickets are smaller. It's like harder uh, well, to... Well, I wouldn't be eating a giant New, Ze New Zealand wetter, that's for certain. I'd no. rather have 20 crickets. Really? As yeah. opposed to just one big... But, uh, yeah, a wetter, it's like a big old locusty, crickety thing, right? Yeah. I guess the thing about insects is you eat everything. Yeah. You eat, you are eating the legs, whereas with a prawn, you're not eating the legs. You're just eating the meat. And it has to have a lot of meat because it's got to get around a viscous fluid, hasn't it? So mm -hmm. it's got lots of muscle in its tail. Um, and I guess crickets don't have to have so much muscle to move around. I don't know. They need pretty strong legs. Mm, that's true, yeah. So that you don't want to be chucking the legs out, I guess. No, the legs are where you... Yeah, the legs are the best bit. So anyway, obviously this isn't the first UK brand to introduce insects to their menus. Mm -hmm. uh, Sainsbury's began trialling crickets as snacks last year in 250 stores nationwide. And you can currently purchase uh, Eat Grubs barbecue crunchy roasted crickets at online supermarket Ocado as well. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, there's a Mexican chain as well that we have in London. I don't know if if it's the rest of the UK as well, called Oaxaca. And they incorporated cricket flour into some of their dishes, including a brownie, uh, I think, last year as well. So crickets, it seems, are in. They're, they're like the popular ones that yeah. we should all be eating. Uh, and it can't be long until like other insects are introduced, surely. Maybe mm. actually some bugs. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I guess crickets are easy to farm because we've already got them for animal food i guess we are, we're very familiar with cultivating them as a species i don't know but yeah. then, then then you said you said silkworms as well and then of course mealworms which we feed to birds they might be next oh okay. yeah mealworm i've eaten i've eaten that out of the bird food and oh yeah really it, like a, it doesn't taste of anything a meal a mealworm's probably my favorite now you mentioned it, it tastes <laughs> a bit dirty like um <laughs> And I've had was some it... human grade ones as well, which they didn't taste any different. Mm. Um, was was this a, a dried mealworm? Yes. No, I wouldn't eat them fresh. I eat a lot of kebabs, which I think is good for the environment, right? Because nobody's sending me, or Istanbul Grill technically, primo primo meat for my kebabs. Like they're having all the worst stuff, all the stuff no one wants, mushing it together and then shaving it into a pit of bread. Delicious. Oh my god, that's so disgusting. But I mean, yeah. Perhaps I don't actually know the process of where that meat comes from, cheap. but it is the cheapest of the cheap. You, I, I, you know, you. That's not free range meat. That's not meat that's been treated well. No, I don't know. I think it's off cuts, right? So if you go and buy a leg of lamb or whatever, mm. you don't buy the whole lamb and butter it yourself. They just chuck the rest of it into a blender and it becomes my kebab. Is that literally how it works? Well, obviously not, but there's, there's herbs <laughs> because, and spices added. But, well, that, that is actually the, a real difference between insects and meat. And we said it earlier on, with insects, you eat everything, 100%. Yeah. The body, the legs, the wings, the head, everything. But that's vastly different to meat, for, where, for example, you'll only eat 40% of a cow, typically. Mm. Which that's crazy. So that sixty percent of that animal has gone to waste, and you've raised that. If you're just looking at like energy costs, sixty percent of what went into that cow is wasted. Yeah. Well, I mean, the biggest organ in the body is, of course, the skin. So we used to use things like that, right? Well, the the, the, the classic example is the bison on the um, 
North American plains and how the Native Americans would have used every single part of the bison from its skin for leather to its horns to its even like bones for, I don't know, I can't even remember, like something for toothpicks or something. It was crazy. They literally used 100% of the animal. Nowadays with cows, with only 40% eaten, you might throw the rest away or, you know, melt down the hooves for gelatin or... um that is that is right, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And bones mm-hmm. and stuff, yeah. Which is like a byproduct of of the meat industry. Well, not like... anymore, because now all the the vegetarians and the vegans are like, oh, I can't have gelatin, so everything's going fake gelatin. Well, what am I going to yeah. use my hooves for? Probably like the jelly and dog food or something. Ah, yeah, that's I true. They sell them for dogs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. fair. Uh, <laughs> and um, and also, I don't know whether this is true, but the skins from the cows that they used for meat aren't really used for leather i didn't think like it's, they. A, it's a totally different cow for leather yeah and then the meat for those cows i guess dog food or something i don't know mm. bonkers um <laughs> but any, anyway back to back to insects so th- one of the reasons insects are so good is because of this um you eat 100 percent of them so you're getting everything that you put in you get out uh, and also they're really high in protein. A cricket is 65% protein, whereas beef is about 50%. And they're also low in fats, which is good, mm. and high in nutrients like amino acids and vitamins. And, of course, they're versatile. You can pan fry them, boil them, saute them, yeah, well, roast them, they taste bake them. horrible. Or pulverise them into flour for breads, crackers and cakes yeah. and stuff, where might, they might not taste horrible because you can mask the taste with other things. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> there's plenty more insects that we haven't tried, that I haven't tried personally. Mm-hmm. Even more than you haven't tried. Like, there could be something delicious out there. I'm sure there is. Yeah. And they're everywhere yeah. as well. And you can cultivate them on food waste. Yeah. So you don't need to, you know, grow fields and fields of soy, and bulldoze the Amazon rainforest. To grow food for crickets, theoretically. I, I think you bring up a good point, though. There are so many insects, loads that we haven't tried. We haven't even got onto the bugs. Yeah. I think these farmers who are, you know, intensive farming mammals, throw that all away, turn them into insect farms. And we, as Westerners, need to get over this and just start bloody eating them. Actually, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to avocado within the next week and I'm going to eat these crickets on a pokeball. I'll, um, I'll arrange something for next time you come up as well. Really? Yeah. Oh, that would be fantastic. An insect eating bonanza. Yeah. An insect feast. Okay, well, we're moving away from the insects. Ooh, okay. How many grey wolves do you think there are in Europe? Grey wolves? Grey wolves, yeah. Well, just wolves. Canis lupus. Canis lupus. Okay. The common wolf. Yeah. Oh, they were going to introduce them to the Scottish Highlands, although I don't think they have done because bloody farmers are annoyed. Uh, you know, so, and... sorry. The farmers wouldn't be angry if they were farming crickets because a wolf wouldn't give a shit. That is very true. So, uh, again, more evidence. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably a couple of thousand Okay, well, that's, yeah, that's a conservative estimate. There are 17,000, apparently. Okay, that's, so that's a decent amount, well, isn't I mean, it? Not, no. not really, but no. Okay. <laughs> so a new paper in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution this week forecasts that the future of wolves could be in danger because of, and I quote, swarms of dog-wolf hybrids. Oh. So basically they've collected together over 40 scientists who shared their views on the issue. And I don't claim to be like an expert about it, but I thought we could have a chat. I thought this is something that we could have a a reasonable little debate on, right? Mm. Or we might be on the same side. Uh, So as humans destroy habitats and breed more and more domestic dogs, they're coming into contact with wolves a lot more often. And in those cases, the possibility exists for fertile offspring between the dog and the wolf. So, dog-wolf hybrids have been detected in several populations of European wolves. Uh, and the problem with it is, like, with a domesticated species going back and breeding with its wild ancestors, like, there's, there's two sets of problems, really. First, the domestic species is usually at a much higher population density than the wild species. So, there are 17,000 wolves in Europe, as you now know. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, how many many dogs do you think there are? Millions. Yeah. So the EU estimated it as 85 million in 2017. Bloody hell. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that's quite a several orders of magnitude more compared to the wolves. Mm. Obviously, most of these are in people's houses, though, like not out with the wolves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and secondly, the second issue with it is that domesticated species have probably been under intense selection for traits that we as humans like, but that might not do much good for you out in the wild. Oh, uh, okay. So the the offspring of a dog-wolf hybrid is actually, it's negatively impacted by the traits that it inherits from the dogs. Well, yeah, this is kind of what I wanted to talk to you about, right? Because I can imagine, you know, if you mate a wolf with a chihuahua, mm-hmm. then the offspring probably isn't going to last long in the forest. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that that's true of every dog-wolf hybrid. No. <laughs> and the, the, of course, the truth is that you can breed two wolves together and it'd just be a, a bad offspring and it'd die. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of think that the... Well, we'll come back to this, but I, I don't know that the traits that will help wolves, you know, in the changing environment of the future aren't locked up inside dogs at the moment. Yeah, it's a very good point. Like, it is just a subspecies, albeit a very highly differentiated one. Yeah, it's the same species. That is weird to then say, no, they shouldn't breed. In the paper, the researchers go through a number of different measures that could be taken to prevent dog-wolf hybridisation, ranging from simple things like educating people about the risks to wolves to try and decrease the number of free-ranging dogs, Mm -hmm. um, to actually going out and like taking the dogs back from the wild, I don't know what they plan on doing with them then, (laughs) or improving the wolf habitat. But then there's reactive measures, and these are what I'm kind of most concerned about, right? Which would involve going out and checking the genes of suspect individuals. And then if we figure out that the hybrids, either killing them or putting them in a zoo or sterilizing them or something like that. Mm. I guess what I want to ask you is, like, how high up on your list of conservation priorities would this be, right? It's really hard to answer this because... Of course, at, at a certain point, once you get to, um, like, con- conservation becomes this thing where if you only have a few individuals left of a species, then yeah. hybridization looks like actually... The only way you're going to save it. Yeah, exactly. And then it's thought of as a, a viable method of preserving th- those genes. And, you know, 12,000 individuals is, is pretty low. I'm going to say, for, for wolves and the entire of Europe. Yeah, 17, but... 17, sorry. It's interesting you bring this up because, as you know, I'm reading a book that you gave me about the whole issue of extinction and human... Well, human-led extinction and our impact on biodiversity and whether actually some of the measures are going to play out pretty well for some animals in the future Mm -hmm. and in the long run. Um, It's an interesting debate, but to summarise it, I think we really focus on the negatives of the fact that we are destroying lots of animals, but also at the same time, it seems that humans have facilitated a lot of speciation that we don't seem to celebrate so much. Yeah, and this is an example of this, right? Well, it's not quite speciation because Mm. it's still a subspecies mating with... Yeah, okay, but biodiversity, increased biodiversity, you could yeah. still, yeah, it's still diverse, isn't it? Like a dog from a wolf. But so keeping a breed pure or keeping a species pure is a, a thing that I'm kind of debating at the moment. And when I finish the book, I feel like I'll be able to give you a, a better answer. But the reason humans don't want these wolves to be negatively impacted by the, the dogs or the, these hybrid, hybrids to come about is is not necessarily a conservation issue, but also like philosophical in that people just don't like to look at how human intervention has affected biodiversity or how we've influenced the trajectory of a species evolution. Yeah. And that is what this I, is. This I understand is that point of view, but I think from the opposite like standpoint, you could say, well, dogs probably basically domesticated themselves from wolves and now they're escaping and going back to the wolves like 
Is that is that much to do with humans? Is that any different to if the dog, like, a couple of thousand years ago had shacked up with a chimpanzee and, the, you know, just had a mutualistic relationship that one of the partners decided to terminate? Like, I'm sure that happens in individual cases all the time of, like, mutualistic species. Why is this a new thing? Dogs have been humans' companions for... Well, is exactly. It... This is another thing that I was going to talk about, about the purity of, like, the wolf breed. Like, I know that we've got way more dogs on the planet than in the past. And because of forests being cut down and stuff, like, the home ranges of the wolves are a lot more constricted. But you're not telling me <laughs> that since we domesticated dogs, none of them have been getting away and mating with wolves. Like, mm. it's def- I mean, it's definitely been happening throughout the whole time. Like, more at the beginning than now, surely when they were sim- more similar to wolves. I guess the issue's exacerbated, though, because the wolf population is so small. Yeah, yeah. If there was a lot of gi- genetic diversity in the wolf population anyway... Then it would be diluted, all of yeah. this hybridization. Yeah. Earlier on, you said that the wolf domesticated itself. What do you mean by that? That's just something I've heard people say, right? That, like... Oh, no, oh. cats domesticated themselves... Okay. Is that what I heard? I don't know. I mean, potentially it's true. I don't know what happened with dogs. I guess nobody knows. But um, it would make sense that dogs started to hang, or wolves started to hang around where humans were and started some, some of them started to develop, like, symbiotic relationships and eventually the wolves were able to be tamed. That, that seems like a, an option just as much as a human... I don't know. Yeah, well, I've, according no. to Darwin, taming an animal is really easy. Any idiot can tame an animal, but to domesticate it is something different. Like, I don't think that's true. Well, I think that I think that some animals are simply untamable. Very, very, yeah, very untamable. Things like big cats. No, no, they were in the circus all the time. Yeah, and they attacked people all the time. Well, well, <laughs> it's not. They're not tame. That's a that's an animal that has been I don't know beaten into submission. <laughs> I don't think that that's tame. I, mm, well. mm, I, yeah, you're right. There's a difference between tamed animals and domesticated. Do, I mean, de- devil dogs do bite people. Yeah. Okay. My cat bites me all of the time, <laughs> just because. I mean, yeah. If it was a tiger, I'd have no arm. But thankfully, it's it's just a tabby. <laughs> you seem to be. Uh, a little firmer in your belief. You you seem to me to be like, yeah, let's just let it happen. It worries me that humans could be spotting hybridization and things like that in nature and sort of egotistically saying, well, this this is our fault. We've got to fix this. When like that is one of nature's mechanisms of like carrying on. If the dogs that are escaping are so badly adapted to live in, in wolf habitat that it's affecting the wolf populations, then surely the dogs all die out in those habitats first. That's true. That's, I mean, that's it. The only... <laughs> those wolves are still under a selective pressure yeah. to get better adapted to their habitat, which has mm. now changed thanks to humans. So if, if some dogs can give them better genes for them to reproduce well even just so for instance i think this is what you're talking about right like if just something to do with size if the dog wolf hybrids they're probably smaller right but the smaller the wolf population is the higher the carrying capacity is they can live in a smaller area because they're smaller so it seems to be like a a good fix like i mean that's just one example but if the rest of the forest gets cut down Making do- wolves more like dogs might be the the key to their future success with humans, like. Mm. And also, I don't know, there's loads of other wolves. Like, it's not like we're at a risk of losing all the canines. We've got 85 million dogs. 